Over 2021, I've grown over 1,200 giant sequoia trees here on my balcony in London. Giant sequoia trees, also known here in the UK often as giant redwood trees, are the biggest species on the planet. I made a video a few months ago about how they were discovered and how they were introduced to the UK, so if you want you can go back and watch that one first. In today's video I'm going to be talking about why I grew so many of them this year. I've been growing giant sequoia trees for a number of years now as a little bit of a hobby in very small numbers, like one or two a year, and it's always struck me that the advice on how to grow them from seed is somewhat ambiguous. There's lots of websites out there with tips and advice, but often there's contradictions in that advice, or there's no data to back it up. It's often based on individuals' anecdotal experience, which is interesting and insightful, but it, it leaves you feeling a little bit uncertain about the actual underlying facts. So I turned to the academic literature. I looked for research articles, people researching how to germinate giant sequoia trees, how to grow them into saplings. And what I found was a lot of the articles written about this were written a very long time ago. I'm talking between the 1920s and uh, the 1960s. That seems to be when most of the research actually took place. The way in which these papers have been written is quite unclear in a lot of places, and there's a lot of methodological ambiguity. In some of the more recent papers where the methods are more clear, it seems to be based around a laboratory environment where you can control everything to a microscopic precision, and a home grower can't really do that. So I decided to do the work myself. I designed an experiment to find out the data on what works and what doesn't for home growers like me. The first variable that I wanted to look at was how to prepare the seeds for germination. The first treatment group was sown as soon as it arrived from a wholesaler. No treatment from me. The second treatment group was soaked overnight in water and then sown. I then did a number of treatment groups where I built upon that overnight soaking in water with a number of periods of cold stratification. Cold stratification is essentially putting the seeds in a refrigerator for a period of time. It simulates the passing of winter, so the seeds start to think that they're coming into the springtime when you take them out of the refrigerator and they start to warm up, essentially. For each of those seed preparation treatment groups, I then split the sample into three to be sown in slightly different ways. The sowing treatments related to conditions that most home growers could find within their own homes. The first group were placed on a south-facing window with full sun for a lot of the day. The second group were placed in a shaded but not dark part of a room. The third group were placed in a dark cupboard. Each of these treatment groups had its own germination container. These were sealed plastic containers within which there was a slightly damp piece of kitchen roll on which the seeds were placed, and each one had 150 seeds. I then duplicated some of these treatment groups using seeds from a different wholesaler just to try and mitigate any sample variability that might have been playing a part here. In total I sowed well over 3,000 seeds for this experiment, each one of which was checked on a daily basis after sowing for six weeks. A big part of the process was data logging. Every time a seed germinated, I had to take that seed, log it in the database, assign it an individual germination number, and then I'd take that seed, uh, plant it in the nursery tray of compost around half a centimeter beneath the surface. I then checked the nursery trays daily, and once a germinated seed penetrates the surface of the compost, then it's considered born and assigned a tree identification number, which is associated with its germination number. In total, over 1,200 seedlings reached the point of birth in this experiment, producing a useful amount of data over the effectiveness of different seed and tray treatments. While a lot of the advice online focuses on the period of cold stratification, here shown on the x-axis, I actually found the position of the germination container had a much larger effect. Germination containers that were placed on a shaded shelf germinated at the highest rates throughout. And it's interesting that even if you have a long stratification period, if you don't put the tray in the right position, your germination rate is still going to be really low. For this reason, amateur home growers should probably focus more on how they're sowing the seeds than how long they're stratifying them for in a refrigerator. It's also interesting that I actually saw a reduction in the germination rate at the longest periods of time, this seemed to be due to fungus building up on the seeds in the refrigerator after around a month. If you were going down a commercial route, you'd probably just use a fungicide to prevent this, but most home growers are probably not going to want to go down that route, so they're probably better off focusing on shorter periods of cold stratification and focusing much more on how they are going to sow those seeds. 
One finding that was really interesting was the effect of cold stratification on the speed at which seeds germinated. The longer seeds were stratified, the faster they germinated. This difference in the time for seeds to germinate may be one reason why cold stratification gets so much attention in anecdotal accounts. When people have stratified seeds for a while, they will notice a sudden surge in germinations upon sowing, whereas you might have to wait much longer for non-stratified seeds to germinate. These weren't my only findings. When you're growing over 1200 seedlings, you start to learn a lot of their quirks. You start to learn a lot of the variability in how they grow, notice certain patterns. The fact that it was all being tracked through a database meant that I was able to identify links between certain factors quite easily. At some point, I'm really hoping to have the time to write up a little bit of a guide based on all my findings for people who want to grow their own giant sequoia seedlings. As for these 1200 trees, well, thankfully I've been able to sell and donate a large majority of them, but I still have a few hundred out there on my balcony. At the moment, I'm still monitoring their development, adding a bit of data on their growth every month. Over the summer, I dedicated so many hours to this project, I can't even begin to count. I remember coming home from nights out and then having to spend two to three hours going through, checking every germination container for new germinations, checking every um, nursery tray to see if any of the trees have been born and then having to log all of that data. But you know, uh, I think it was worth it. I generated a lot of data that could really be useful to anyone who wants to grow their own giant sequoias at home someday. So hopefully it helps somebody.